Hi everyone, it's James here. Welcome to my final Vinyl Finds video of 2023. So I've got a big pile of records here to show you, trying to empty the inbox. Uh, I'm not going to quite empty it, there are a few records uh, that I bought this year that I'm not going to show today. There's some new records and there's some which are being parceled up for me uh, for Christmas, so I'll have to show those in the new year. But I thought I'd come on and try and try and show you a few things. So I'm going to start with uh, some purchases from this morning from Heightside Records, my usual market traders uh, here in Lancaster. And uh, I tell a complete lie, these are not from Heightside Records. I'm going to start with I'm going to start with three records from Oxfam. I do apologise, and then we'll move on to some other things, including records from Heightside. So. Three records by the same band, picked these up this morning from Oxfam, and The Stranglers is a band that I'm trying to collect. These three records uh, were all there today, along with a couple of other ones, but I decided I wasn't going to pick all of them up because they weren't cheap. This one was $8.99, uh, this is The Raven, and unfortunately um, it is a fame reissue, which is always slightly annoying, but uh, it's definitely one that I wanted for the collection. Well, I want all of them for the collection, so there was no way I was going to leave it behind. Uh, this is the one that's got um, Duchess on it. Nuclear device, great album, and uh, yeah, eight ninety nine. But it's in really good condition. All of them were in excellent condition. In fact, they'd had some in the window. Apparently, when I bought these, uh, the guy told me that a big load of Stranglers albums had come in. They put a few in the window, and those had sold almost immediately. Um, and these were the ones that had been put out. So, uh, am I going to be able to get this back in? It's fighting me every step of the way. I've done it. So, um, yeah fame reissue of The Raven and this one, fantastic to find this, I know this is a great favourite of Richard McCook, uh, this one was um, £9.99, you know a bit more than I would like to pay but I have seen these records going for much uh, higher prices than that, this is the, the Men in Black which is The Stranglers, possibly The Stranglers most post-punk sounding record, this one is not a fame reissue. It's on the, on the Liberty label I can see here. This one is actually a gatefold, which I never actually realised. So there we go. We've got um, got The Last Supper there, I do believe. So, um, yeah, this is a great record. It's very dark. It's very edgy. It's very left of field. Sounds, sounds a bit like wire in places, actually. It's definitely got a bit of a post-punk vibe to it. There we go, on the Liberty label, so yeah, couldn't leave that one behind either. Um, I don't know how many Stranglers albums I'm now missing, I'm still missing quite a few. Uh, so I'm going to keep um, keep hunting for them. So that was the second of the three. Now this third one uh, is a record I've never actually heard before, never actually owned it before. Uh, don't know too much about it, but this one, uh, this one was nine ninety nine again. All of these come with the inner sleeves, which I've not been showing you, but uh, I've got quite a lot to get through today. So also a copy of Oral Sculpture. Uh, this one comes from what year does this one come from? Absolutely no idea. Nineteen eighty four, possibly. As you can see here, produced by Laurie Latham. That's interesting. He's the guy that produced. Um, Cozy Found Tutti Fruity by Squeeze, their most overproduced album. He was Paul Young's producer. Uh, this one has got one of the famous songs on here, Skin Deep. Um, so, yeah, oral sculpture. Like I said, not one that I know. Rather a large discography, really, The Stranglers. Of course, you've got all the posts, the post you Cornwall records as well, which just adds to the fun. So those were Oxfam, and now we're going to go to Heightside Records. We are going to return to Oxfam again. I've got a bit of a, a batch of records here from um, a few months back. So we'll skip now. We'll go to Heightside Records, the West Yorkshire um, record vendors who come to Lancaster every Saturday, and I've picked up some really, really nice things from them this year. I've shown quite a few already, but um, these ones I hadn't showed. So finally got a copy of Scratch. The second Peter Gabriel record, which I've been looking for for years and years. The first four Peter Gabriel albums, the first one I picked up in about 1994 or something like that. And I didn't see another one for about at least 10 years. And then in the last two years, I've picked up the other two. But this was the last one I was looking for. Surprisingly difficult to stumble across these in the wild. So it was great to get a copy of this an incredibly uh, dark and dystopian picture on the back. I really like this record. I've heard some things about it. Most people seem to rate it at the bottom of the first four. It has a more, I suppose, a more basic stripped-down sound than some of the others, but um, I'd, his 
solo style really started to develop properly on the third album and then was taken one step further on the fourth and then of course then you get into the big uh, epic commercial era with so but i think that's quite a nice record and at some point i'll do a little feature on uh, on peter gabriel one to four because i think they are quite interesting records i've heard his new album which i think is okay i don't think it's fantastic but i've heard it and it's it's kind of all right it's quite good in places this one really chuffed to find it. This was the last record I needed by this band. Been looking for them. Uh, been looking for this for a very long time. Bebop Deluxe and Futurama, which is their second album, produced by Roy Thomas Baker of Queen fame. This album uh, had some um, quite difficult times in the studio. I think when they were making it, don't think um, Bill Nelson was too um, too enamoured with Roy Thomas Baker. Have I got that right? Is it the Roy Thomas Baker on this one? I'm starting to doubt myself now, because I know that John John Leckie started working with him, I think it was on the next album, wasn't it? It was recorded at Rockfield Studios. Um, just trying to see now. Would you believe they don't even credit the producer on this record? Drive you mad, don't they, these credits on these albums. Anyway, here's the inner. I think it's Roy Thomas Baker. If it's not, somebody will comment and put me straight. Anyway, the second album by Bebop Deluxe, Bill Nelson, great West Yorkshire-born art rocker. Um, I've got all the five Bebop Deluxe albums now. The only one that needs to be upgraded, I got a really bad copy of Drastic Plastic, which is their final album from 1980 one or two or something that sounds pretty crappy gonna have to replace that again not that easy to come across in the wild anymore there used to be a bit of a staple in charity shops but uh, less so less so these days anyway bebop deluxe and uh futurama which is a fantastic guitar record if you've never heard it and then this one i saw um i saw dale gatefold 33 show this one and it is a record i probably would have picked up anyway because i do have i do have their four most famous albums, but I might have skipped this one uh, if I hadn't seen Dale talking about it in glowing terms. This is the debut album by Super Tramp, um, just called Super Tramp, and it features Richard Davis and Roger Hodgson, who are going to go on to be the two guys, you know, the two mainstays in Super Tramp for many years, and a couple of other guys, Richard Palmer and Robert Miller, who I don't think stayed the distance. I know Super Tramp went through lots of uh, lineup changes early on. This record is quite early, it comes from I think it comes from about maybe 1970 or something like that and the sound the super tramp sound hadn't really developed properly at this point that's what dale was saying in his video this is on a and m uh it's more like a kind of just a oh, i don't know what you'd call it sort of art rock tinges of psych here and there but um the fully fledged super tramp sound is not yet there interesting record pleased to have it again i will try and do a tramp video at some point because um, I do have a fair few of their albums now. Okay, this one I've been lurking in the boxes at Heightside for weeks and weeks and I kept leaving it there, kept leaving it there and in the end I thought it's crazy why I'm not picking this record up because you don't see them very often so I went back for the final time and uh, yeah, it was still there so I, uh, I grabbed it. So here we go, this is Join Hands by Susie and the Banshees which I think is quite an early one, isn't it? Maybe their second album? Uh, so delighted to get this into the collection. I only have one other Susie and the Banshees album, one of the later ones. The name escapes me. Um, got a CD box set of their stuff, which is which is really good. Obviously, a very bleak and uh, sometimes scary sounding post punk band. Some would call them a fully fledged punk band, I guess. But um, very nice label there on Polydor. Um, so yeah. Uh, of course, yes, this has got the Lord's Prayer on it, the final song on side two. It's quite a hard work, this record, really. That might have been why I hadn't gone back to pick it up, but uh, Susie and the Banshees are one of those bands, really, that um, you sort of got to have if you're a collector that specialises in British pop and rock from the 70s and 80s, which I am, I guess. Um, they are kind of essential, so I'm pleased that I finally went back and grabbed it. I guess maybe the price had been slightly putting me off as well. I think it was... I think it was over a tenner and I was just feeling a little bit, but uh, you know, it's in good nick and um, yeah, good to have it. Susie and the Banshees. Right, uh, just a quick, 
quick bizarre excursion now into my local antiques place which has gone right down the pan a couple of years ago there was a really good record seller down there who always had really good stock he's gone now and taken his stock with him and there's this hardly anything there but I was poking around there somewhat forlornly the other week and I came across a couple of things there was a box of records and they were all really good looking records classic sort of 50s stuff um, Wooly Bully and the Pharaohs copy of that there I got really excited picked them all out and was just starting to think about you know buying them and then I thought hang on a minute I'll just check the condition and <laughs> I pulled them all out and they were all just scratched to pieces just not worth having at all this one was the only one I found that was actually in good nick and uh, so I thought I would pick it up so this is Bill Justice and Raunchy not a record I've ever seen before Beatles fans will know the story George Harrison famously could play Raunchy on the guitar and so the story goes they were on a bus with Paul and John and George somewhere in Liverpool and it was a kind of informal audition for George Paul said to John hey this kid can play Raunchy uh, so John asked him to play it George played it and uh, that was his um, entry ticket into the Beatles so uh, quite a nice thing to have like I said I've never owned it on vinyl before I've got it on a CD somewhere but um, yeah a bit of a raunchy <laughs> raunchy cover going on there um, so yeah it's on and it's quite nice too because it's actually on Sun Records so um, you do not see those every day so such a shame like I said this box of records quite a lot of stuff on Sun and a couple of other kind of early labels but they were all just scratched to pieces so um, it was quite nice to come away with this one really annoying as you can see though the sticker on here I don't know why they always do that it drives me nuts uh, but they do do it so yeah anyway that kind of made my morning really good fun Uwe Matron. Right, back to Oxfam again now. So an earlier an earlier visit to Oxfam and just a few things, none of them sort of earth shattering. This first one is by far the nicest. This was um, 9.99, I think it was in the window. Oxfam in Lancaster has furnished me with quite a few Miles Davis albums over the years, this being the latest one. So this is Sketches of Spain. Uh, it is an original copy, I think it's an American pressing on CBS, so really chuffed to get this. Um, one of the collaborations that he did with Gil Evans, of course. A um, bit of a smouldering Mediterranean vibe on this one. Quite, um, quite introverted, quite melancholy, definitely not a finger-clicking jazz album, but um, yeah, just a nice album and... Uh, uh, again, you know, Oxfam has delivered for me over the years in terms of Miles Davis, so there's another video that's waiting to happen. So, um, cool stuff, bit of Miles. This one was just a cheap and cheerful pickup. I paid less than a fiver for this. Not a band I know a lot about. I've got their first couple of albums, first two or three albums, which I do enjoy. I've never loved any of their stuff really but I kind of always quite like it so I picked it up um, didn't know too much about it this is orchestral maneuvers in the dark and junk culture um, not quite sure where this falls in their catalogue it's 1984 so I'm guessing it, it's a reasonably early one um, I thought this was okay I, I didn't like some of the keyboard sounds on this they keep using this really awful it's like uh, brass keyboard um, 80s brass keyboards uh, bit nasty. You, uh, you get them as well on Squitty Politi, Cupid and Psyche, which is a good album. I do like that album, but um, yeah, those br those 80s brass keyboard stabs are quite nasty, and this album has a fair few of them, but um, I'll keep it in the collection. Uh, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, not a band I know a huge amount about, but um, yeah, it was, it was just a nice cheap find, really. Uh, from Oxfam, and this next one also a band that I am I am collecting really, um, and uh, again there is a collection video to be to be done with this um, with this group. So this is Rage in Eden by Ultravox, and I think I only paid about you know two pound fifty three pounds for this one. The hit off this was the Voice and uh, the, the Thin Wall as well. Um, obviously one of the um, one of the mid year albums. Recorded and mixed at Connie's studio in Köln, West Germany. Bit of a kraut rock um, thing going on there on, on Chrysalis. Anything happening with the inner? Just some lyrics. So, yeah, a bit of Ultravox. Quite fond of Ultravox, really. They're one of those groups that takes me back to my childhood, you know, Vienna. Um, I know the Mijur version of the band gets a bit of a knocking, but um, I'm quite fond of them, really, so... 
nice to add that to the collection. And this one actually, a band, um, I have their second album, which is which is okay, it's pretty much, you know, it's pretty all right. Uh, so I thought I'd pick this one up. I think this might be their debut album. This is The Tourists and uh, Reality Effect. So this is the band that, um, almost said Amy Winehouse then, Annie Lennox was in. <laughs> Annie Lennox and Dave Stewart were in prior to forming the Eurythmics. So what year does this come from? This comes from, could be any bloody year, couldn't it? It could be 1948 for all I know. No, it's not going to tell me on the sleeve. Um, so let's have a look and see. Oh, it's quite a nice label. We've got a date on here. 1979. What a great year for music that was. There we go. Reality Effect by The Tourists. So um, the guy that wrote the songs for The Tourists, what was his name? Um, is it Pete Coombs? Yeah, I think so. A bit of a tragic story, really. It was his band. Annie and Dave were in the band, but this guy, I think it was Pete Coombs, was the guy that wrote the songs and sang everything, but uh, the band didn't really break through in a major way, and then I think he ended up having a long life of drug addiction and alcoholism after Dave and Annie left and, you know, started having all that, all that success. What a terrible, tragic story. Just one of those stories in rock and roll history. And then this one finally, um, a record I've been after for a very long time, just because it's one of those records that you see people showing and I've always been curious about it. I like the single, but I'd heard mixed things about the album. I know Rob Walker was not very impressed with this record and uh, I can kind of see where he's coming from. This is My Sharona by um, The Knack. Get The Knack, My Sharona by The Knack. And um, this was 1979 again, and um, produced by Mike Chapman, actually, of um, Chin and Chapman fame. Yeah, um, they were kind of, they became really big really quickly, is my understanding, and then there were some accusations of them being hyped, the similarities of the cover to the With the Beatles cover, and then on the back here you've got a bit of a white on black uh, help soundstage type thing going on. There was a bit of a reaction against them, I think, and their career nosedived uh, almost immediately after this record, I think. And um, I thought it was okay. I think it's a great single, and then maybe, you know, a load of stuff which is not as good as the single, but I wanted to have it in the collection because, um, again, it's one of those iconic albums from that era, and, you know, it is an era that I do collect as a collector therefore gotta have it the knack not a bad album not a terrible album but definitely not one that's gonna knock your socks off i don't think uh okay so we're going to finish off with a few really nice records from my hometown wrexham where um i've rediscovered recently there's a great little record shop there called moonlight records which i used to shop at many years ago when i was a teenager and uh, I've been going back there again recently and I picked up some really nice things. My next finds video probably will be showing some more records from there, but I'll quickly show you the ones that I found. I think it was on my last trip. So I picked this up. This is the Shangri-Las and this is a reissue. Um, this, um, I bought this thinking that it contained the song by them that I really wanted and then it turned out that it didn't. I was misremembering thinking that the song I wanted was Remember Walking in the Sand but actually it was Past, Present and Future which I wanted which is the one where it's a sample of Beethoven's Moonlight Symphony with this spoken word thing but it's still good to have it. Uh, classic girl group Splendour from the 1960s written and produced by um, Shadow Morton, who was a bit of a Phil Spector wannabe, Phil Spector pretender. I actually prefer his productions to Phil Spector. I think they're a bit um, a bit more digestible, a bit more space um, between the instruments. Not quite so much of a racket, but um, certainly classic. Some classic girl group sounds on here. Nice to find that. It wasn't expensive, and um, it is a reissue. It's on the Redbird label. Uh, so, yeah, that was nice to get. Sounds good. Um, give him a great big kiss as the opening track. Leader of the Pack, of course, possibly their most famous song. Good cover version of Twist and Shout. Some nice tracks on there. And then this one, this really made my day when I found this because this was the last one I was looking for um, of this artist discography. The hardest one to find for some reason. The others are reasonably common-ish uh, in the UK, but this one less so. 
So this is Little Feet and Sailing Shoes, which is their second album. There's a twofer of this lurking around. Um, I can't think what, I think it's the first two albums. I know I've left that behind a couple of times because I've got the first album already. So um, really, really great to get this one into the collection, finally, gatefold. And um, this is the album that's got, I think, the original version of Willin on it. That's right. Yeah, it's on there. Uh, that was re-recorded later for one of their later records. Forget which one. Produced by Ted Templeman. Um, you know, good stuff. Swampy, swampy, bluesy sounds from Lowell George, Bill Payne and the crew. The band that um, guested on, let me see now, the John Cale album, Paris 1919. They're on there, aren't they? And they also appear on a couple of... Um, Robert Palmer's records as well, but um, this is probably their classic album, so great to get that. And uh, that did make my day, really. This next one, actually, this was just in the cheap bins at Moonlight. I think I think I bought it for maybe a pound or two. Didn't know anything about it, and uh, just thought, well, I'm going to get it. It's Del Shannon, who I'm a bit of a fan of. I say I'm a fan of his, you know, I've, I've got a couple of his records um, and uh, it sort of dates back to the Wilburys era really, getting into the Travelling Wilburys, you know, he was tangentially associated with them uh, because of certain things he'd done with Tom Petty and Jeff Lynn. This is this was his comeback album from 1981, Drop Down and Get Me, and um, I looked on the back and saw that it was produced by Tom Petty, uh, who I think features on the, I think he's on the... Yeah, he's on the inner sleeve there. So uh, I thought that would be a good bet. Um, you know, Tom Petty does not tend to associate himself with, with crap records. And uh, so I picked it up, and yeah, it's a good album. It's got some really nice uh, songs on it. Sea of Love, the first song. Not sure if that was a single, but I did I did recognise it. Um, so this album's got Mike Campbell on it. Ben, um, ben Montench, Stan Lynch. So essentially, it's a uh, it's a Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers record, but with Del Shannon writing the songs. I think there's some co-writes with um, with Tom Petty and um, Tom Petty producing. So that was that was good. Um, this record, uh, this is the final one I've got to show you. Actually, this um, an artist that I've been collecting for years and years, and again, their records don't come up that often in the wild. So I grabbed this. This sleeve is not in the best condition ever, um, but um, I thought, yeah, I'm going to have to pick it up today because it was it wasn't expensive. So this is Renegade by Thin Lizzy, <coughs> which is I think one of their later ones, isn't it? Bit of a dull inner, isn't it? Uh, and what label are we on here? Orange Vertigo, nothing special going on there. So those are the finds from uh, Moonlight Records in Wrexham and uh, like I said, I've got some more records to show uh, from there in the new year, along with maybe four new records which I've bought, which I need to group together. Uh, so uh, in the meantime, I'll take my leave and say thanks for watching. See you next time.